Well, good Sunday afternoon and welcome once again to the McFarland Hubbard House, headquarters of the West Virginia Humanities Council, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm Eric Wagner, I'm the executive director of the council, and I welcome you on behalf of the staff who work collaboratively to create this series, but special thanks to program officer Kyle Warmack, who has curated this series since 2020. As most of you know who have been with us for this year's series, this year's little lectures are supported in part by United We Stand, Connecting Through Culture, a special initiative of the National Endowment for the Humanities that seeks to leverage the humanities to foster civil discussion of controversial topics and to combat hate-based violence. This initiative and its uh, focus has led us to discuss several weighty and somber topics over the past few weeks, and more and more it seems to me like the old cliche isn't exactly accurate, even those who do learn from history sometimes seem destined to repeat it. Andrea Pitzer, our guest, guest and today's speaker, understands this perhaps more acutely than most of us. Born indeed in Parkersburg, she spent much of her journalism and nonfiction writing career going into the depths of human experience and psychology, from Arctic exploration to the works of Vladimir Nabokov and much more. Her newest book, One Long Night, A Global History of Concentration Camps, is drawn from nearly two decades of research, world travel, investigation into document archives and personal interviews. Even on a first read, it's the sort of book that is remarkable for, among its other qualities, its determination to tell often horrific stories with an extraordinary, but it turns out, necessary balance of objectivity and empathy. It is a book that also seeks, as we do, answers to the inevitable question of why, a question that is at once geopolitical, philosophical, and intensely personal. <clears throat> To me, it's difficult to imagine the stamina and resolve that a journalist must have to tell the stories presented in one long night accurately and in detail. But the result is a book that performs one of the central and in some traditions even sacred acts that we are called to do in response to atrocity. It bears witness. Here today and following a short preview video to share that witness with us is writer and journalist Andrea Pitzer. Andrea. So first of all, I'm really delighted to be here today. I don't often get a chance to come back and give talks in West Virginia, and so it's always really nice when I do. I grew up in Parkersburg, but we always had our school field trips to Charleston, so I have fond memories of those days. I want to say thank you to the West Virginia Humanities Council, to Kyle Warmack for putting all this together, for the lovely introduction, thank you, and also, of course, to the National Endowment Humanities for funding. Um, we will have a question and answer period at the end, so try not to forget the questions that may come up across the talk that I'll give. 
I'm going to try to stick to time. As you can see, global 100 years, there's a lot to cover. So I think there probably will be some questions from you at the end, and I'll be delighted to answer them. But I'm going to try to sort of trace the arc of what motivated me to write the book. I actually wanted to read this book is the reason this book got written, and it didn't exist. When I wrote this book, there was no book that looked at how did the idea of the concentration camp enter the world, how did we get to Auschwitz, and what happened after. There were hundreds of people that had studied Ravensbrück for 30 years. I mean, there was a lot of knowledge out there, but I like to say as somebody who isn't in academia, sometimes I have a kind of liberty where I don't have to go narrow and deep. I can actually bring together a lot of different work and say, what is a bigger idea behind this? As a journalist, that's one of the things that I love to do. And I think this topic, it was especially useful for that and has ended up helping to spur the creation of a comparative camps conference each year. So now people from these different regions, different times in history get together to discuss this very issue. I'm going to give you not that deep and narrow version where they come together, but I'm going to take you quickly through the first idea of concentration camps rose out of the 19th century. And there were many roots to it, but um, some of the key ones were in Spanish treatment of indigenous people in North and South America, relocating whole populations, moving them into forts, having them sometimes do forced labor. The British in India, and one can say with early treatment before the US was a nation of indigenous peoples, and then later the American government treatment of indigenous people, again, pushing them out of a space and into some kind of detention or holding area or forcibly relocating under guard. So you sort of start to see this begin to simmer in the 19th century. But two things really bring what we think of as the modern idea of the concentration camp into possibility. They're both technological, because the will was certainly there beforehand. But what made it doable was this idea of mass production of automatic weapons. Because before that, if you wanted to detain a lot of people, you needed to have a lot of people in order to detain a lot of people. But once you have mass production of automatic weapons, the guard force that you need becomes much smaller. And a parallel version of that that plays a similar function was the mass production of barbed wire. So not just that it had been developed, but there were actual factories that could mass produce it and put it in places. So when you can pin people in where they can't just hop a fence and get out, and you have weapons to hold them, and some camps, it was more important to have the barbed wire. Some camps, it was more important to have the automatic weapons. But the two together made it possible for the birth of the modern concentration camp to happen. And what I'm defining as a camp, just so we're all kind of on the same page with that, is the mass detention of civilians. So we're not talking prisoner of war camps, OK? Mass detention of civilians without trial. And I'll come back to that in a second. Without trial, generally on the basis of identity, religion, political affiliation, in other words, belonging to some kind of group rather than an activity or a crime that they've carried out. And the question of doing it without trial can vary in different camp systems, but generally the way that I used it to frame, is this a concentration camp, is this not a concentration camp, was to say, in the existing legal system in that place at that time, was this an add-on done extrajudicially? Was it an end run around the existing legal system? Because you can't just say, well, was it undemocratic to do it? Because most of the countries weren't democracies to start with. So is this idea of end running the existing uh, police force, the existing judges, the existing system to lock up civilians preemptively? And that begins for the first time in, as we think of it today, the concentration camp in Spain, with the Spanish government oppressing Cubans who were fighting for their freedom at that time. And these fights had been going on a really long time, decades off and on. And at one point, the governor general in Cuba said, I don't think we can defeat these rebels unless we resort to extreme measures. And the key one that he listed was that we need to pull all the peasants out of the countryside in these contested areas detain them, and then kill everyone that's left. And do it like, just kill them on the spot. Anybody we find in these areas, then will be killed. And he said, but as a representative of a civilized nation, 
I'm not willing to do this. So Spain said, all right, you can come home and we're going to send in somebody who will. And you saw his picture on there, the butcher. And so this policy was only in place, it was in place for a brief period of time, but the suffering of relocating mostly women and children on foot, taking them away from the food that they're growing, putting them in places with little or no allocation for housing and no way to grow food themselves, unleashed disease, unleashed just death on the road in transit. And it, it, the suffering was depicted in the US very broadly. And it was actually one of the key reasons we entered the Spanish-American War in 1898, which is a piece of history that's largely been forgotten. I talk a lot about that in the book. And the world's reaction was horror to starving women and children and you know, it, in this attempt that it was so much greater than the casualties from the war itself that it was seen as barbaric. And yet in those first couple years after it happened, the US turned around and did it in the Philippines. Germany did it in Namibia with some uprisings of the Nama and Herero people. And the British did it in what some people think of as the first classic model of the concentration camps. You have the nice rows of white tents and the barbed wire and the guards policing it. And that was in the Second Boer War. So these are the colonial camps that are around the turn of the 20th century. And the world's reaction as a whole is horrific. Even the ones that are doing camps, the governments that are doing camps, are saying, well, ours aren't like those, right? So everybody doesn't like them. But the ones who are doing them, they like the ones they're doing, but nobody else. So it's generally seen as barbaric. It falls out of popular approval. Some, like the Reichstag, denies money to the military for doing this. So there's a public reaction that is very strong against this. People railing in parliament against it. And so it actually fades out of favor. And there's a time where it might have been able to vanish from the war, from the world, if the Geneva Convention, uh, the precursors for this in The Hague, if they had managed to encompass concentration camps in their decisions of those times, and they didn't. And so there's this moment where they might have been stopped because they were quite in disfavor. But then we get to World War I. And what changed with World War I to bring camps back, in part, uh, was partly just that people forget, which is a bad thing. But the sort of more rational reason, which is also a piece of it, is that for the first time in a massive conflict, you have multiple parties where um, drafting of military age males just becomes the default. So before that wasn't so much the case, but now any military age male is potentially going to be rallied into being forced into the military and fighting against you. So it doesn't matter if you're, let's say, German and you've lived in Britain for 20 years and you're a grocer. Now you're a threat because there's this question, are you like, are you secretly going to join the forces? Is Germany going to mobilize you somehow? So there becomes this massive paranoia over foreigners and enemy aliens in these countries. And so the answer for that used to be you give word, parole, and you say, I'm not going to participate in the conflict. I'm going to stay here. You don't get locked up. But now we're talking a whole different scale of potential combatants, and the paranoia is a very high level. So British. British government after the sinking of Lusitania, those of you who remember that it was a big moment in that war, there was such an outcry to do something. The government fell, like all these things happened. One of the things that they turned to was locking up enemy aliens. Germany did the same thing. They were both empires. So now you're talking, it's reaching out into different parts. By the end of World War I, there were dozens of countries with internment camps. Preemptively, nobody had committed a crime. We're just locking you up for the duration so that you don't end up in hostilities fighting against us. And this really rehabilitated the idea of a concentration camp. It had been this horrific idea, savage, brutal, people were dying left and right, starving. We we're gonna have nice camps now was sort of the tone of everything. And so there were lending libraries. You could send money to people in detention. You could pay more and maybe be in an officer's camp. You could study for a degree in theory. This didn't actually happen a lot, but you could study for a degree like correspondence courses. And so this kind of neutralized the idea. And then the Red Cross, which had actually been involved with camps and trying to help ameliorate some of the suffering in them from all the way back in Cuba, the Red Cross sits up, sets up a whole bureaucracy. And they're the ones that actually help make all these transfers between countries. And so you have a bureaucratization. You have people assigned numbers 
You have people turning themselves in and going into camps when they're told to. You have this whole stage that's set where camps become normalized. And it's actually not strange. It actually becomes something that people are like, oh, well, this is what we have to do because it's wartime. And you don't see the same kind of suffering and sort of genocidal impulses and death and murders. Um, there are definitely some camps that are, especially ones closer to the front, that maybe change hands. Things can go very badly. There are some shootings that do happen. But you don't see the massive level of death and mayhem that you saw in those colonial camps. So at the end of World War I, you actually have now a camp bureaucracy set up in dozens of countries around the world. And you have populations that have their own cultures and their own ideas about maybe who should be in camps and how to do that that go to the roots of their own nation and their own history individually. So I think of it a little bit like the colonial camps are the roots of a tree, and then you have the trunk of a tree, and then these, these branches begin splintering out from the World War I camps. So in the immediate aftermath of World War I, you have the British who are fighting Irish independence, and they start using the laws they have about this kind of detention that were put in place really for the war, and they start using them to do detentions of Irish people that haven't necessarily done anything yet, but they're pretty sure that they're going to do something at some point. So the British use these laws immediately in the wake of World War I. And in Russia, you have the camps beginning to empty out because, of course, after the Bolsheviks have power, they leave World War I. And so they're releasing these prisoners, and that's its own whole messy history. But the early on, both Trotsky and Lenin and some other people have an idea. We should be detaining people who are our enemies internally. And so this is the first pivot we have to, oh, it isn't just those people from over there or those people who fought us in a war. It is those people that we are opposed to on some other level, on some political affiliation, on some other basis. Then shortly enough after it, there is the Russian Civil War that happens, and camps are used widely in that. And this becomes the basis for the gulag, which develops across the 20s and is institutionalized at the end of that decade on a, a massive, massive scale. And so camps never really leave the world for being rehabilitated, but you see these two elements that stay in these two places, but they're not the only two places. Camps actually stay in the world globally, again, in this more neutral way, this more inoffensive way. And they are used in, across Europe, South America, North America, to house the homeless. You want them off the street, you put them in a camp. The mentally ill, you want them isolated from society, we'll make a little town in Brazil outside of decent society and they will go live, we will make them go live in that place. And so camps became this social improvement tool by which literally just deciding these people can be locked up we're going to do it. And it was seen as appropriate. If, did any of, I don't know if any of you are aware of the Tulsa race massacre from 1921. It's kind of come back into the news in the last few years. Camps were used in the wake of that. After this murder spree in which many, many people in what was called Black Wall Street in Tulsa at the time, they were killed, the remaining African Americans from that neighborhood were locked up in a theater that was called in the newspapers at the time, we have a concentration camp established for them. If you're missing your help, in other words, the person who does your yard or cleans your house. If you, so a white person could come and ask for their help and get them out of the camp. But people who wouldn't personally vouch for their person, you know, it was still in the language that's pretty reprehensible at the time. But one of the issues that came up uh, was that a lot of the people who were coming for their help didn't actually know the names, the, the real names. They knew the nicknames, Missy or Sissy or whatever they had nicknamed the person but they didn't know how to get their person out because they didn't even know their name. And yet these people would be entrusted, who were prisoners, to someone who was taking them out. But only under those circumstances for a period of time were people released from what, again, in the newspapers were called concentration camps. And I say this, and it's really important to understand this, not to put any of the things that I have mentioned so far on the level of a German death camp, which we're going to get to, how is that different? But an important part of what I found in doing this research was that it's this four decades of these different kinds of camps becoming accepted and percolating around that then leads to 1933 when Hitler comes to power. 
in the very first weeks of Nazi rule, before Hitler has even really cemented rule, there's still a chance he might be moved out at this point. They are already coming into Dachau and they are already going to retool it. They're detaining people there. They're already going to retool it into being a dedicated concentration camp. This is part of their goal. And it's fascinating to look at the early stages of the language around this stuff. And it's clear that at the beginning, what the Nazis wanted was to kill off their political opponents, to detain some of the rest of them. But you could get out, if you were Marxist, you could get out of camps, some of them very early on, if you just said you weren't going to participate in politics anymore. So what they're trying to do in the beginning is tamp down the enemy like so that they can really seize power. They're focused on holding power. So they're arresting a lot of Jewish people, but they're not arresting Jews as Jews, as German Jews. They're arresting their political opponents. They're targeting the people that they see as an individual threat to them, torturing them. If you were Jewish and you ended up in a camp at that time, you faced much worse treatment than somebody else who was rounded up for some other reason. So from the beginning, we have this preferential, horrific treatment of Jews, but we are not having Jews as a group rounded up in this moment. They are focused first on targeting these political enemies. And then second, they move into this social welfare phase. They're using them when the Olympics are clean up the streets, get people off the streets, right? So they're putting people into camps that are repeat offenders of small crime stuff, that are homeless people. Gypsies begin to, as they, it is an offensive name now, we call them um, the Roma and the Sinti peoples. But at the time, the, the laws were these gypsy laws. And so it was loitering laws and different things were used to focus on particular populations. Gay people, especially less lesbian women, but gay men were targeted widely at this point. Not to be killed, not to be exterminated. We're not in that realm yet. It is literally, they're, they're thinking of shaping this society and they're taking the elements that they see as undesirable. And there's a little bit of that Russian idea from early on of re-educating and reforming them. And there's a token nod to, maybe we can see if some of them will be a part of this. And then there's, that's just like put away. That has gotten rid of after a couple years. But literally in the first five years of the Nazi camps, you don't have what the camps will be you know, infamous for in the end. It isn't until 1938 when Kristallnacht happens. The Germans have been trying for years to force Jews to emigrate. They've been trying to get them to leave and they haven't been really successful in part because people had learned the lessons of World War I. Okay, you go to camps, you deal with this kind of repression, you just bide your time as the undesirable, you know, persecuted minority, you turn yourself in, you get locked up, you'll be released eventually, and this is going to pass. Yeah, sure, you'll get a prisoner number, you have to, you know, you have to register with the police. It's not a big deal. We've seen this before. And so I think there was a world reaction, both because the world was particularly anti-Semitic at the time, but also it had learned this lesson of World War I that the camps weren't this monstrous thing. And so people did go into them. And it wasn't until Kristallnacht where the Nazis really rolled out massive repression on every level against the Jews, whom they had been making laws against for years, right? Couldn't be a citizen, you couldn't have a camera, you couldn't have maps, you couldn't be a university professor, you couldn't use a hot public hospital. There were all these laws that had been made, but the camp side of it, the rounding up, happens in 1938. But even after that, more than 90% of the tens of thousands of Jews that were arrested during November 1938 were ultimately released. So even that, at 1938, five years into the camps, the idea was still to try to push people out. And it isn't until the war comes when Germany is making, in, so 1939, massive advances to the East. Europe is falling. They are capturing whole towns in Poland that are almost exclusively Jewish. They have this enormous, they haven't been able to move out the German Jewish population that they were hoping to push out. And now suddenly they are in control of literally millions of people that they are encountering. And they begin to have this horrific discussion that, we are, that we've talked about so much in history of the final solution. But in the meantime, in all these Nazi camps that have already proliferated, they have been doing different methods on an individual level to figure out how to kill people. And they've tried different means, like some of them are just like literally one person at a time bringing them into a doctor's office. Early gas experiments happen. But the, the sort of the horrific top moment 
of, or I should say the bottom moment, because it's truly the devolution of humanity, is when they come to the conclusion, because for a long time they're talking about deporting people to Madagascar, they're talking about um, having Polish labor camps, they're talking about all these things, and then they come to this decision that, that mass extermination is what they're going to be doing. And so then you have what is the later idea of concentration camps that we develop, which is the institution of death camps. And this is the first time, there are some camps before this in Namibia at the turn of the 20th century, in Russia during the Gulag, there are some camps whose death rates match some of the German camps in terms of the percentage of people who go there not coming out. But Germany is the only example we have of the industrialization of the entire process from beginning to end. The reconfiguration of the whole railroad things to maximize this actually working against the war effort, costing yourself like actual victories and supplies and things in the war in order to more effectively corral, transport, and kill Jewish and Sinti and Roma populations. These are the ones that were targeted for genocide. And so in 1941, we have the early manifestation of Auschwitz. And in 1942, we have the Birkenau death camp that is then rolling into tremendous effect and more than a million Jews will die at Auschwitz. And in the meantime, the Germans are still conducting the non-death camp concentration camps. And because of the war, eventually when they're coming on the losing side and they're losing territories and all this, the conditions in the rest of those camps devolve horrifically. And some of them then feed or feed from the death camps and it becomes much more amorphous. But you have this dedicated set of designated death camps and then you have all these others. And the world had not seen camps used in this way to this end before. And so after World War II, when all this begins, the Soviets liberate Auschwitz and they see what has happened and the world reels in horror, I think we sometimes don't understand that it took 10 or 20 years to even understand quite what had happened there because this was so unprecedented. It was understood that vast numbers of people who died, but for a long time it was thought it was mostly Catholic resistance. And many of them had died there, and that was one of the horrors of Auschwitz. But so many Jews didn't survive, and the communities were so shattered and were so dislocated that even assessing the effect of that on the worldwide Jewish community took a long time. And so there's been these different narratives coming, and I met and did a talk with the director of the Auschwitz Museum a couple years ago, one of the things that was amazing to speak with him about was that how long it took to actually, it's not this narrative or this narrative, right? That's the horror of Auschwitz. It's this narrative and this narrative and this narrative and this one. It's all of these things that happen. Eventually humanity did understand that and never again became an important thing. But the Soviets with camps they seized, they turned them into camps, the one in the Eastern areas that they had seized after World War II. And then they started doing political detentions and it became integrated. Sometimes people were shipped to gulag sites or to the Far East. Camps never went away. And so after World War II, you have these sort of two uh, splits that happen because the world kind of goes into this bipolar mode, right? You have the Cold War and camps exist in both parts. They take on different characters though. So what happens in the Soviet sphere of influence is that you have gulag style camps. So the Chinese camps were tremendously influenced by the early gulag. And in Eastern Europe, you had whole detention systems based on the gulag in Cuba, in Vietnam. So this became a part of a worldwide phenomenon there. And then on the allied side, you had a lot of powers that were trying to put down rebellions of uh, people who wanted independence. So you're coming to the end of the colonial era and dealing with the dregs of that. And so you find people locking up whole tribal populations, whole groups in an effort to uh, what was seen as an anti-communist crusade in that moment, but often ended up meaning suppressing like local community groups just on the basis of what tribe they belonged to or where they lived at the time. So you have the French in Algeria, you have the French in Vietnam and later the US in Vietnam. If you've ever heard of the, we must destroy the village to save the village talk, that's relocating people out, putting them behind barbed wire and trying to isolate them from these other forces to keep them on your side. So all these things are tendrils of how camps played out. And in some cases like Algeria, you end up sort of decimating the whole society by trying to, in theory, protect it from communism. 
And so camps were used in this way. You had interrogation camps to get information. You had torture camps to figure out what these rebels were doing. And in a lot of cases, it ends up being women and children that have their lives wrecked, and even the women who are detained. It isn't that there's a political system that won't turn to camps. What we found, and with Japanese American internment during World War II here, Supreme Court okayed it with some concerns, saying that they didn't really think that, you know, they were trying to justify it on some level, even as they were saying it was okay. It was clear on some level that they were stretching themselves and that they knew that. And eventually they became part of the instruments for undoing it. So a democracy in which the processes are working as they were intended to can still create these things. But the difference that I found in doing the, the research that I did was that where it is possible for a system to change, to change leaders, to have protests, to uh, have an independent judiciary, the odds of being able to arrest it or reverse it are much higher. So there is no political system that won't turn to camps, but typically if you can replace the leader, if people can protest, if there are still some independent judges, then those are the mechanisms by which it becomes undone. But in the world as it was, they didn't have to continue perhaps, but they did continue after World War II. But people, Auschwitz was, and the death camps were such a quantum leap beyond what had been done before that people reframed in their mind the concentration camp as equal to the death camp. And really this early history of how did we get there? Because you couldn't get to Auschwitz without the World War I camps. People wouldn't have turned themselves in. You know, they wouldn't just, they wouldn't have done any of these things. So even though these other things were different, they were necessary to arrive at this point. And by forgetting this history here, we just reproduced it, right? So Spain and Cuba, colonial power suppressing a rebellion, we're right there again later in 1948, 1950, 1955, 1960. In the 1970s, we have all throughout Central and South America, you know, we have Chile, we have Argentina, Brazil, Guatemala, and there is such a concern. Again, the anti communism is a big motivating factor, but you have this turn to juntas and military dictatorships. And one of the shifts that I noticed that is kind of interesting that happens in this moment is that the camps don't last as long. And I think it's partly because information networks were so much quicker in this moment that it was harder to hide what you were doing until it was too late. And people paid a little bit more attention than they used to. So those pictures of the soldier, like in the stadium in Chile with the gun, like those were taken by like AP photographers came in. And because Chile had to pretend like, oh no, these aren't camps, we're just locking them up for a while. You can take photos. And they were trying to control it, but they couldn't really control the situation. So camps became shorter lived and they were actually, they just would kill the people and then bring the next group in. And so I think of this, it's terrible, but I think it's, it, there's, it's not accidental. There's a kind of a business model that comes, which is this just in time use of detention, right? So you do improvised detention sites and just in time. So you take small groups, you do what you need to with them, torture them, move them out of the country, kill them, exile them and you bring the next group in. It's understood you can't run a big massive thing without the world turning against you. And in the case of Chile, the world needed to keep the USA's involvement and support. It couldn't have continued if we had really pushed back against it. So you see these kind of weird innovations happening. And then you get to, if you remember the first World Trade Center bombing, you know, and the US sets up this Muslim database and starts doing some really weird detentions that no cases came out of. And this helps to set the stage for what happens at 9-11. And you have, again, this horrific event, this just earth shatteringly, psychologically devastating, shocking tragedy that happens. And the response is very much the pattern of what was the response to these kind of uh, rebel and terrorist attempts, you know, small group attempt to have a big impact and to get the more powerful party, Spain in the case of the camps 100 years ago, to overreact. And so then you have immediately in the wake of 9-11, we are not only pursuing this uh, attempt to find the Taliban and deal with this issue, but then we are, we are going into Iraq. We are going, and, and in between those two, we are in dozens of countries with special operations. We're setting up black sites. We're detaining people. We're torturing them, as we know now. And so the ideals, so the, the action of doing something was more than justified. 
But the response was this typical reaction to the rebel response, which is to do things like camps. And so then we set up these black sites. We set up Guantanamo. Uh, I went to Guantanamo twice to try to figure out where does it fit into here? If you're in jail for 20 years without being tried, at what point does that begin to mimic it? At what points is that military justice that's not actually made it to trial the same, different? There are a lot of gray areas, but what we're seeing is right now in the world, the pattern of detention without trial for massive numbers of people is alive and well, and that the war on terror has become an excuse for it. If you know the, um, the Uyghur situation in China, the te mass detention of civilians, the language used to do that and justify it in the world is very much the language we used after 9-11 for the things that we did. And then it became much more difficult diplomatically and pressure-wise to act against somebody who's using these ideas in an even worse way. Um, you have the border state of Assam in India, where Muslims are being stripped of citizenship and detained. You have the Rohingya, which we saw in the video here, in Myanmar, and I sneaked into those camps to meet with them and see this whole people pushed outside a city and put into these separate camps. And, and the children are, they have no future. I mean, and now it's been more than 10 years that these camps have existed. It was supposed to be this temporary situation until things could be reintegrated. This just gives you, as you can imagine, the tiniest arc of what is in each case in each country also deeply rooted in the national culture, national identities. Who would you pick to lock up? How would you lock them up? It's easier to do it one way in a country, it's easier to do it another way in another country. But this principle of taking civilians who have not yet committed a crime and isolating them from society into some other location, uh, again and again, when it stays in place, we end up with usually a permanently fractured society, an exiled group, and one of the awful things that we see happen also is that when a society allows it to happen to one group, it is impossible to keep it from happening to others. Now, you can maybe reverse it, but as soon as it's okay for one, all it takes is somebody who figures out the right means by which to include another population in that dis despised community. And in every culture, there is a despised community. And so my argument is that we shouldn't do mass civilian detention without trial, because even if there were a magic group that deserved it, and I haven't found one yet, but even if they existed, that it will be used the wrong way. It will institutionalize the wrong things, and it will cause tremendous amount of harm, and something like the US, of course, in the world too. So when the US border camp situation was going on you know, 2018 into 2019, I was speaking out against that. And, and some people would say, this isn't Auschwitz. How can you compare it to Auschwitz? And it's like, no, it's not even in the same universe as Auschwitz. But we don't take the first steps on this road. Like, what do we learn from that if we don't learn not to do the things that lead to that? And, and it itself can be bad enough, in, in my opinion. But in doing this research, too, what I found was that there are a certain number of people that are more comfortable. And it, it's, there are arguments about whether it's some genetic predisposition or it's a cultural predisposition to a more authoritarian mindset. They like somebody to be in charge. They like somebody to have clear plans of action. And these things can be part of just a normal tendency of, well, you want somebody as a politician who can get things done, right? But there is a tendency of a certain part of the population who will accept pretty extreme behaviors in that kind of thing. But it can feel hopeless if you're caught in one of those political situations. And of course, I talked with people that have been tortured in Chile, people who had been in Nazi Germany, people, I mean, I've talked with people all over the world. And what they have said is that those people that really like watching people be punished and watching bad things happen to others and being part of some, it's a minority. So you should not lose heart that, that this is how the world really is. When I was writing this book, my brother said, it must be really depressing to realize this is just where humanity goes. This is just who we are as a species. And it's like, no, no, no. I said, did you read my book? You know, like, <laughs> because the answer is actually, it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of propaganda. It takes years of work to get people to accept it and to maintain those systems. 
when Nazis rolled into France, they tried to make a mini Kristallnacht in France. And there's these amazing letters where they're like, the French seem to hate the Jews, but they don't tolerate, like they won't kind of get on board with like doing really, really bad things to them. And they, it, it was like, we're really baffled. And the answer, in my sense of looking at the historical record when I looked at all these documents, they hadn't had a chance to do the same kind of propaganda that they seeded in those five years before they did the massive roundup targeting Jewish people as a whole population. They had not had a chance to do that. And while there had been a lot of anti-Semitic political writing in France before that, there was not the kind that motivates people to lock up and execute and exile. That was just not it. So I don't think humans naturally just do this. I think they have to be coached into it. So if we look at the ways to prevent it, I think, you know, speak up, don't tolerate those kind of exclusionary talks. And I don't mean like just get in a shouting match, but literally like support your libraries, support your educational facilities, support the people that are helping for independent judiciary to stay, run for an office locally. I mean, there are all kinds of things you can do to shore up the kind of positive speech about what institutions will prevent these things from happening in the long run that you can be a part of. And it, it doesn't have to be, you know, the biggest things in the world, but we see that there are always people willing to work on the other side of this. And just as an example, we were talking before this lecture began today that, and I'm sure you all know this because you're from here, but three weeks ago, the Patriot Front guys were walking, you know, right through this part of town. And, you know, you can have whatever debates you want to have about the Confederate flag, but the Patriot Front guys carrying it, like they are not in favor of the kinds of institutions I'm talking about building to protect everybody from being detained, to protect everybody from things that nobody should be subjected to. And so there is always going to be this minority that's willing to do that. And there's going to always going to be people who are working against it. The danger lies in that mushy middle. And the way that mushy middle goes along with these kinds of detentions and camps and that we get to the worst part is when they are so afraid and so hateful. And some people can be coached to fear and some can be coached to hate. In my experience, and I'm not a psychologist, so I don't make any huge claims about this at all, but in my experience talking with people, the people who can be coached to fear, that's the heart of it. And so education is so critical because what are you afraid of? You're most often afraid of the thing, the secret fears you have that you want extreme measures taken or when you, you don't know it, you don't understand it, you don't know what to do about it. And education can make those human, can show people what, will, what they can do to not have the fears that they're having or to learn the reality of it and how to address it in a way that doesn't mean giving in to these people that they kind of know that they don't agree with, right? But they're so afraid they're willing to go along. And so when the camps arise are when you have those people who have malicious intent and they get a lot of people to go along with them. And without that, you really can't have camps but the world we live in, we do have. And so that is my whirlwind tour of 100 years and, uh, and six continents. And I am just skirting, of course, the surface of all of this because you could literally, we could spend 10 lectures on, uh, 10 one hour long lectures on just any single camp that I looked at because the, the, the art and the plays and the resistance and I mean, the things people did in them were amazing. But what I tried to do with this book was to say, how do we get here? And like, what does it mean? So I will take your questions now. <laughs> Interestingly, well, there, there's fascinating and strange commonalities on the back end of the Soviet and the Russian camps, not so much on the front end, although the Nazis tried to blame the Russians. It turns out they were both despicable camp systems and they had generated out of, again, these World War I camps mostly themselves. But you had a lot of people who were in Nazi camps that then ended up in Russian camps. And so that you actually had culture traveling between different camp systems sometime. And there's an amazing story of the reverse my, I think it's my life under two dictators. It's in my book. Um, and her name is Margar Margarita Boiber Newman. 
And she was a communist who fled Nazi, the Nazis and went to Russia just in time to be executed, or not executed, arrested. Her husband was executed, but she was arrested during the Great Purge. She was held in the Gulag. And then during the period where Stalin and Hitler were allied, she was transferred. The, the Russians turned her over to the Nazis. And so she wrote this book about, and so it goes into some of those things of the commonalities. There are some weirder ones, like the South American camps, uh, like in Argentina, for instance, sometimes there would be pictures of Hitler in the police stations because a lot of fascists, of course, fled there. So you had some of this fascist culture, like deliberately then being part of the junta in this way that the Nazis were. Not that they brought in like plans for how to build Buchenwald in Argentina, but some of the, the ideas of policing. And you see things flow from the colonial era, the, Argen uh, the Algerian stuff. The, they piloted, the French in Algeria piloted the um, throwing people out of helicopters. And then you see that transfer to South America later. And then really once you get into the global war on terror, there's an amazing, because by the end of the 20th century, all of these government militaries, they're collaborating. They're talking about it. And they're dealing with a real problem. How do we deal with terrorists? How do we deal with insurgencies? How do, sometimes they're not fighting for a freedom cause. They're, sometimes they're just bad people. And yet the ways that we choose to fight them are often our own means of destruction for whole parts of our population. Because when we adopt those means, like we can't do it cleanly, right? Like it's good. And so the longer we do them, the more deeply we do them, the more likely they are to come home to where we live. So not just in the interest of foreign peoples, should we be careful, but also, and, and for reasons of rightness and humanity and justice and all that, but literally this is the story of the camps. What starts in the colonies gets brought into Europe in the heart of empire during World War I. What starts in these other places is what we see coming back. And one of the ties that, that has been written about a little bit is Chicago police interrogations and Guantanamo, that there has been some, there has been some ties with some personnel between those. So there's a fluidity in language and in action that you see literally because some people have been in both places, but sometimes, you know, weirdly, Trotsky was in a concentration camp, an internment camp in Canada during World War I. And he was really held, I have to say, against the letter of the law of who should have been able, because the Russians were our allies at that moment, but they knew that with the revolution happening, he was in New York and he tried to get back to Russia to join. And they didn't want him there because the Russians were our allies, but they knew he would not help the allied cause, right? So they held him in a concentration camp where he organized and he did all this other stuff. He goes back to Russia and Russia starts doing concentration camps. Now, I'm not going to say there's a one to one that, that Trotsky founded the idea of the Russian gulag on a con Canadian concentration camp. That's just ridiculous. But it's a fascinating thing. And I will say that he wrote a pamphlet about his unjust detention in concentration camps and how democracy was flawed as a result of that. And it was required reading in the Red Army for the ones who could read. It was handed out as a pamphlet to all the Red Army. Now, again, I'm sure a lot of people didn't read it, but these things that we imagine as completely isolated are not isolated. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. I am very open. When people identify me, like Andrea Pitzer, historian, like I never identify myself as a historian because I have tremendous respect for the people that have done the PhD work in, in uh, historical analysis, have done their dissertations on that, have been through the system or have been teaching it. And so I generally, I write about history and I'm a journalist. Um, I try to hold myself to some of the schools and standards of those. And so I will say every book I've had, I've had offers from academic presses that were willing to do it. Um, I have been through peer review myself, so I have written peer reviewed material. I don't mistake myself for a historian, but I think I see that as a liberty for myself in a good way that actually binds me to a story that those historians can't tell. Literally, I had people from this comparative camps conference that rose as a result of this being published, that my book being published, to say thank you because we couldn't, not that they couldn't talk to each other, but like to get the funding to get somebody to sponsor, a, an institution to sponsor a conference, to do that across different eras and different, it's like, but what is the thing? And so sometimes being on the other side of it and bringing it into public discourse and framing it in a way, I, I joke that they go like very deep, 
and I'm broad and shallow. And I'm joking when I say that because I try not to be too shallow. But I understand the difference between what I'm doing and what they're doing. But I can tell this story to say there are these overlaps. This couldn't, and it's just clear, this couldn't happen without this. And now you can say, why couldn't it? Have? I mean, historians can argue about a lot. But I can lay out a path, and then other people can follow it and maybe make it a little better. And I have no doubt that every single one of the people at these conferences are going to find things that are deeper than I knew. So I just, I guess I would say I don't get blowback from it. I expect more blowback. I actually expected more blowback from the Jewish community around the world. And I was shocked when they invited me to, in, to interview the head of the Auschwitz Museum, you know, to do this partnership thing with them. And I was shocked when synagogues would then have me come and speak because my biggest fear in writing this book was that, that people would see me as relativizing the Holocaust. And it was very important to me not to do that because the people who do that are really bad people. <laughs> um, the people who use the Holocaust instrumentally to say, well, I mean, it's the same people who say, well, they were Irish slaves. It's like, okay, there were Irish people in bondage. There was not a worldwide chattel shipping experience that, and we can talk about that horrific Irish experience in America without then using it to downplay what chattel slavery was. We can talk, I think, about Auschwitz and where it came from without downplaying Auschwitz, but often the people who pick up the topic of what I'm talking about, they talk about the Boer camps where white women, right, Dutch white women and children were, well, that's camps too, you know. Hitler used the Boer camps as an excuse, you know, and so there's a real danger in minimizing that. And so that's not at all what I'm here to do. I actually, it took me longer to write the book. I was, I had to write my editor. I knew right away I wasn't going to have it done on deadline because of the weight of, of this, like that I was just going slower. I was going, but I was going slower. And he wrote me and he said, I have, are you writing anything? He's like, I have, I have never had anybody come to me this early ahead of the deadline to say it wasn't going to be ready on time. So like, what, what, you need to tell me more. And I, so I sent him chapters. I'm like, no, I'm writing. And he's like, okay, these look fine, you know, but I just knew it, it, to, to process it was really hard. And I will say I was braced for that the Holocaust, you know, when you dive into it, it's just an open, it's an open wound that like never resolves. And so I'd made a place in myself that this would just not be something that, you know, you can see how we got there and hopefully we can stop it, but that humanity could do this, that, that people, little houses right next to Beer Canal, and they were there then. I mean, how do, in the zone of interest is the recent movie that sort of looked at some of this. Um, you know, how do we do this? And so I had made that place that to sort of, okay, I'm giving up this part of myself that's going to always then be tied to the Holocaust and have that grief. But what was hard in a way I hadn't expected was when I went into the Rohingya camps, I sneaked into them in Myanmar in 2015, and it was ahead of Aung San Suu Kyi's election, and it was really thought, she was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, it was really thought she would find some way to thread this needle, and she totally turned her back on the Rohingya people, just threw them under the bus, threw the country under the bus, basically, allied, you know, with the generals to do this, and then they pushed her out, of course, as well, but I really thought, perhaps, that with my uh, book, and people seeing this phenomenon that it might make a difference, at least for the Rohingya, at least in this one place. And in the end run, it didn't. And so I still talk to people, you know, I can still like get messages into them and stuff that are in the camps. So my book came out, they helped me, you know, at risk to themselves, not the most tremendous risk in the world, but there was real risk for them. And, you know, it didn't change anything. And so it's hard, it, it was very hard that first year, because this was actually my second book. Uh, he had said it was my roast. It was actually my second book, and it's been out several years. And so it was hard in that moment, because I did go to Guantanamo, and I talked about the dangers it represented. Somebody I went to college with, literally married my college roommate, was before the Supreme Court at one point, arguing that we ought to be able to put American citizens in Guantanamo. So beautifully educated, incredibly intelligent, sophisticated person with the best education that went to Harvard, went to Georgetown, was at Oxford, I think, and ma was willing to go before the Supreme Court and argue. So now he didn't win that case, thank God. But in that first year after the book came out, it was very difficult that I had brought these current examples up and nothing seemed to change with them. It, it, I felt a little more useful, at least, after the border camp situation happened when family separations were going on. And then some people would have me on TV, they would have me talk about it. And it didn't sell a ton of the book, but I at least felt like it injected this language into the lexicon of of the public discussion that was being had. Because like, 
GQ did a story and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was saying, yes, it is a camp, look at this, read this. And I mean, I know that she's a polarizing figure, but there were other people as well. And so it, it vaulted, not me, which I didn't want, but the idea into the discussion. And there were always gonna be people who say, well, it's not Auschwitz, that's ridiculous, and they just dismiss it. But some people were listening and saying like, well, wait, what is it? Like, let's think about what is it, what's going on here, and what do we wanna do? So I had to give up some things to do the book, but I'm happy that the conference exists. I'm happy that this entered the lexicon. When I was at Neuengamme, a camp in Northern Germany outside Hamburg, I met with the archivist there and I said, do, why do you do this work? Do you do it so that it won't happen again? And he said, oh no, I don't, like he doesn't have faith that it won't happen again. He said, but if we don't at least preserve what happened, then we have no hope at all. Like it's not even possible to keep it from happening, right? He says, he's just kind of keeping it in the zone where maybe, maybe we'll stop it, but he has no confidence that we wouldn't, but just that if, if we don't even try to preserve the actual facts of what happened, then, then we're completely lost. And so we're not completely lost. Yes, another question. It's really fascinating to me because there's all these borderline areas. And so there were so many options. I tried to be some, I mean, with, with Guantanamo, it just felt like a big enough example that it was right really just outside the edge of what I was talking about, but I wanted to address it. But there were so many things I could have addressed, like ghettos. There are many places in the world where people have been forced into ghettos. And it's like, is that a concentration camp? I tried to focus more where people had been relocated. And so then I kind of, ghettos actually have a tremendous amount uh, in common with concentration camps when they're locked in and, you know, but I kind of moved ghettos to the outside. Um, I, I wish in retrospect, I had spent even more time. I talk in the prologue about Native American reservations. I wish I had done more just to emphasize the degree because as an American, this is like part of my patrimony, right? So um, you, I don't think you get to concentration camps without the Spanish treatment of indigenous people and the British treatment of indigenous people and well into the 20th century, US treatment of indigenous people. You have questions of citizenship, you have questions of sometimes being locked down. You have questions of um, extrajudicial, even though now they're institutionalized in the US, means used to control people. Early on, I would say that, that the early Indian relocations and, and deaths were less part of a concentration camp system just because of what I talked about in the very beginning of technology. It wasn't that they weren't willing to do it. They could only do it so much. So tra some trail of tears, detentions along the way in forts and being marched. And, you know, there are things that have pieces of the concentration camp system um, in them, but this is almost like it's the precursors. And without those, you can't get to it. Later, yes, there are, there are certain reservation situations where you're talking about that it's almost indistinguishable from a concentration camp system. But what I found with the Native American, it was the taking of the land was the primary goal in what was happening. And usually with concentration camps, it's the exiling of an undesirable people. It is uh, not for labor purposes inherently or for uh, property pur purposes. Those things all come together because you can get, like the gulag became very much about labor, uh, expropriating people's labor. But in the beginning, it was about moving the undesirable. So at the heart of it, I would say that the concentration camp phenomenon is based in that moving of the undesirables. So with the Native Americans, it was land seizure. And with African Americans and, and chattel slavery in the US, it is the enslaved people were actually being brought in, right? We're not exiling somebody from society. We are bringing them in in a subjugated capacity to take the labor. So where the social undesirability of the population or the threat of that population, once you want to remove them from where you are, that's sort of the heart of the concentration camp phenomena. But in terms of being held against their, like, you know, slavery has many echoes with it. But the real precursor is the treatment of indigenous people by the British overseas um, and by the Spanish, British, and then American governments here. And I think if they had had the technology 100 years earlier, you would have seen concentration camps very much in their modern version, their 20th century versions established much more quickly. And the places you would have seen it would have been in British Empire and early US Empire and Spanish Empire locations. So I, I think that um, 
that those things are in large part indistinguishable from what drove concentration camp formation. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy thing because that we, we'd have to narrow down which period are we talking about because it does slightly different things in different periods of Indian removal and you know, different methods that are used. So to answer it more specifically, you know, we'd have to talk specific eras, but absolutely it's part and parcel of the same motivating spirit. Oh, absolutely. And I think we see this, uh, unfortunately, we see this with um, Uyghur populations and some other populations in China right now. And I think we really need to be careful as a people for several reasons. One is there are a lot of U.S. companies collaborating with Chinese companies on like, in, like um, law enforcement and like identifying threats. And you hear also things about like the... Uh, where they hear shots and they record shots and they trace them to certain, a lot of this technology, I have to say, is terrible. It is terrible. And it, it, even if you knew who you wanted to arrest and they had done something, it picks the wrong people. So, so first of all, we have the technology is advancing and we are ceding more and more control to it. It's often still really, really bad. So you're not even getting the people you think you're getting, but how it's being created is also tied up with really bad motives in a way that doesn't just taint you morally, I think, but like it messes up your whole project. Like the, the Chinese have worked extensively. I did a foreword to an academic press book about how technology is being used in China against the Uyghur population. And, you know, there's these technologies that like supposedly can tell if you're Uyghur or Han Chinese and Han Chinese is the desirable dominant culture, you know, and why are we partnering with a company that is doing this, right? Well, because we think we have this limited thing that we want to work with them on. And so I think creating these worldwide networks of surveillance tools that don't work right, target people for horrific reasons, and that imagining we're going to somehow bring them home and use them for a noble purpose, because this literally is the story of the camps from the beginning. So there's the Cuban camps, which were the people who were, who were in them. Were called, it was called the process of reconcentración. So we're, they had been out in the countryside, you're reconcentrating them into the city. So they were reconcentrados, was what they were called, reconcentrated people. So concentration camp. Literally, like five years later, you have the Boer War camps, maybe four years later even. And they're like, oh my God, you know, in Parliament, this is just like what the, the Spanish were doing. And they're like, no, 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 no. Our camps aren't anything like that. So literally from the first time where you have two camp systems where they could be compared, Immediately, the country that's doing it is, no, we're not doing that. And so no matter what we say about, well, we aren't going to use it for what the Chinese are using it for, and we're not going to abuse it the way the Chinese, the Chinese, Chinese government's abusing it, it, that's not what actually happens on the ground because those justifications get made. And, and I do think, however, that we do have, uh, even though it's really flawed technology, the ability to track, trace, and, and have data on people is so much more than it used to be. The ability to hide, the ability to... You know, we are much more at the mercy of that. And so I think you could see roundings up happen much, much more effectively and dangerously and quickly. So that's terrible. I will say that Japanese American internment use big data. Another thing that used big data is the, you know, IBM, the old hollow earth punch cards. You, some of you might be old enough, you remember those. I just remember them at the very end of it in computing, then kind of switched over to other stuff. But IBM, like, brought its hollow earth punch card system into service in Europe for the Nazis during World War II. And that, that was how whole populations were tabulated in terms of target populations. So data has always been not neutral in this. Companies want to make money, right? And so they will often supply things and tell themselves that, you know, it's not going to be used the worst way or it's not going. But what we find is this technology is very hard to undo once it becomes acceptable. So it was incredibly difficult, I will say that, because there's a, um, a Pulitzer Prize winner named Catherine Boo who wrote a book called Behind the Beautiful Forevers that's about this slum in India. And she's, I had this vague feeling for years, and she just encapsulated it so beautifully in an interview when somebody said, well, how did you pick this family to be representative of this whole phenomenon in India? And she's like, oh, nobody's representative. They're just like... They just represent themselves. She said, I would never want to make anybody representative. And so my whole credo as a, 
journalists writing narrative is to be true. First of all, only, you can't make anything up, which is the challenge, but, but also this is this person. Don't make people, don't use people to stand in for something and give them the burden. Like it's my burden as the writer to, to give you an idea or, or sketch out something. I can't like make a, that person into my tool to do it. That's wrong to do to people. Like this is one of the other things out of the Holocaust. Don't use people for things. But in doing this with the camp, it's like, oh, if I'm only, because I, I wanted to tell the numbers story, but if I just wrote a book about numbers, who, like nobody cares, right? So for each system, I follow one person through that system before they were arrested, how they were detained, what happened to them, and often what happened after, or if they didn't survive. But of course, I had to, you know, pick at least some people to survive or the book becomes just unfathomably hard to read. But already then I'm skewing. I mean, I have an Auschwitz person, a Jew in Auschwitz who survived. We're already then this is not representative, right? So then how do I weigh the rest of the book to show that this person isn't re representative, but still see that people did resist. It was possible for some small number of people to be lucky enough, sometimes just pure luck, be educated enough that they were useful in some way. But at the beginning of the book, I have a, a statement to say, this book is completely skewed. Like right before you read it, I'm going to tell you it's completely skewed because who do we know about? We know about the people that survived, right? And what they can tell us about the people that died and what records are left about the people that died. And whose accounts do we have? We have the accounts mostly of people who could read to write them down. But most of the people that went into camps were not people who could read and write. They weren't, you know, who survived? The people that could get office work, like, processing other prisoners, perhaps. They were useful. They had more than one language. So we're so skewed outside of the bulk of the people that were lost that it's always going to be this incomplete story. But I tried to find powerful stories that would illustrate something about the society and the camp that they were in without making them stand for something. But that said, I understood that I was, by only representing them, limiting myself. And so, for instance, most of the chapters have one person with occasionally like just a little small references to other things. But when I did the gulag, it lasted so long. I, I did three stories. And for the Auschwitz chapter, I did five stories just to, to make clear that, you know, the massive scale of some of the things that were done. But it was very important to me. And when I went to Cornell to give a talk, the Jewish studies folks brought me in and we went to dinner afterward. And one professor said, I noticed that there's like almost no theory in here at all, which goes to your, your question about what was the reaction of them. And another woman, she said, she said, like, thank God. She said, you know, because she said, it's too easy. It's letting readers off the hook if you just do this and talk about theory. So what I told them then was what my principle had been, because I'd had a principle, that I could only do it in the prologue. That once I started telling the individual stories of these people, that they, their experience had to be more important and real, not only to be able to connect with the readers of the book, but just for humanity. It's not about theory, right? It's about this real thing that happens on the ground. But at the same time, I think you, I need academia. I need those people. I want that theory because it sometimes tells us how these stories connect in ways we wouldn't think of. So I did read the theory. I did talk about it. But luckily, as not a historian, and I would have, when I've written peer-reviewed stuff, I have to put the theory in. And this book couldn't have been possible with it. So by being the journalist rather than the historian, I can get to this history, but I can acknowledge the theory, I can point to it. So if people want more, they can go get that. But I don't have to present the whole history of everybody that's gone before that's talked about this. I can say, as a journalist, here's what I think you need to know and have umpty mazillion footnotes where you can, end notes actually, and you can go read the things yourself to find the people that are the true historians that have done the work for 40 years, you know, cause that's not me. So anyway, I'll be over here with books if you want them. Thank you so much for coming. I know it was a real obstacle course to get here today. <laughs>